evening. Good evening. Let's all stand. Number 656. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Even though it got dark early, we're going to sing about sunlight. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love in all my darkness in me. because we're not getting it outside with these shorter days, but uh, it's, uh, it's all right. It's still um, wonderful to be saved. It's great to be in God's house, and uh, even if you are coming in almost dark, you can be seated. Thank you for being in church tonight, and you do notice it. We've got, uh, we won't have these days as long as they are now for several months, but uh, that's all right. We'll just still have the love of God in our hearts and have a good time anyways. But thank you for being in church tonight. We'll go over some prayer requests in just a little bit. And uh, you've come on a great night for our prayer meeting. And uh, so if you're here with family, then I challenge you to pray together here in just a moment. If you're here by yourself, then uh, please do the same. Pray and ask the Lord's blessings. We won't um, go over every name that's on our prayer list, but uh, perhaps you're joining us via live stream. We want to thank you for doing that. We're going over our prayer list, and we'll read some of these names aloud. Maybe you can take some notes and be praying for these, because in just a few moments, we'll have the organist play through, and we'll pray over these requests. And so we're praying for attendees and uh, folks from our church in recovery, Sherry Bolden, Renetta Edwards, Bob Bryant, Michelle McConnell, Peggy Milhorn, Jeanette Cassie, Larry Russell, Lynn Davenport, and Frank Walden, and uh, certainly want to keep all of those lifted up in prayer. And uh, of course, it's maybe not on that list, I'm not sure, but we want to um, Pray and for the um, Presley family. I'm so sad to announce, if you didn't already hear it, Miss Diana Presley went home to be with the Lord. And uh, so we're praying for James, her husband, Molly, their daughter, and the rest of the family there. And so she is a faithful, faithful soul and a wonderful worker here at the church. And so I want you to really be praying for, uh, for that family, if you would, please. And then we're praying for others that... Um, that uh, are having surgeries coming up or are already have had some, as we just mentioned, some of those, uh, the Larry Russell and Lynn Davenport and Frank Walden, all of those having open heart surgery here in the last week and a half or so. So keep them in your prayers. We're praying for Summer Scroggs. She was driving up yesterday and having testing today up uh, in preparation for surgery coming up here uh, later this year. And so once you keep Summer in your prayers, that the Lord would just bless and lead and guide those doctors and the staff that uh, help get her ready for all these testings and then that major surgery. And then we're praying for uh, Mickey Archer, Edith Rourke, and Pat Scalf, and Johnny Saylor, and Brother Tom Morris, and Debbie Mullins, and Debbie Deacons, and Brother Virgil Stout, all of these that are battling cancer. And I want you to just keep them lifted up in prayer. Pray one for another. And uh, we certainly appreciate you doing that. We're praying also, though, for Lynn Anderson with some health concerns. Joel Johnson and Jan Saylor, Pat Shaw and uh, Sharon Pritchard, Sherry Edens, Walter Johnson, Bob Edwards and Kaylee Johnson. And is uh, having some, uh, some issues going on, maybe um, appendix or something. 
and um, uh, some something going on there with a cyst or something. I'm not sure, but praying for Kaylee and then praying for Angela Silvers. And uh, we've just got a lot of folks to pray for. I want you to keep them lifted up in prayer, if you would, please. And then we're praying also for uh, Miss Charlotte Bryant and Alana Hubbard teaching the Berean class, the blue class, classroom down here. Uh, they they certainly do a lot of a lot of calling and working and teaching, of course, and that's a wonderful department. Keep them in prayer, if you would, please. And then praying for Brother Dan Rogers and uh, Craig and Sharon Harmon as uh, they labor together for the Oasis ministry. And it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. We're seeing a lot of folks that are getting introduced to our church, and we're so thankful for the work that goes on. You keep praying. And then... Um, and then Brother Dan Rogers, pray for him and his wife as they uh, continue to work here at the church and so appreciative of what the Rogers do and keep them lifted up in prayer. And so we're thankful for them. And then Brother Joe Shaw. And as you know, we're praying for Miss Pat Shaw up in the uh, health concerns. And so I want you to keep her lifted up in prayer. And Brother Joe so faithful to continue to um, to help his dear wife. And we're th- uh, we love Miss Pat and thankful for her. But keep her in prayer and keep Brother Joe in prayer as he's on the deacon's uh, one of the deacons here at the church. And then praying for us number four, Doug Deacons, Jordan Wheelock, and Isaac and Cora Wampler, and just asking the Lord to bless that bus and bless our bus ministry and send people in to work. And uh, we certainly appreciate the prayers in all of those regards. And pray, if you would, if you haven't voted already in the early voting, either get early voted or plan on voting on the election day. But uh, God's people ought to be voters, ought to be people that vote biblical values and... Um, and, and just look at who you can put in the office to uh, best get along or, or to most align with Scripture. And then sometimes you say, well, neither, neither of the people are. Well, I'll take the closest one and vote for that one. And uh, so we ought to pray, though, not only for, uh, for, for our country, but pray for the, um, for the voting process. There are four amendments on the ballot this election, uh, and then there are... Uh, just a little word there about that from Tennessee Independent Baptist for Religious Liberties. And so I want you to keep that in, pr- in prayer. We're praying also for the missionaries, Brother Fagali, our Ed- Edgar Fagali. We're praying for the Sissons, our good missionaries, the Philippines, and then the Marshals who were here just a month or two back. And uh, we were able to help out with a vehicle with them. So please keep them in your prayer. And then don't forget to pray for Victoria Radford over in Burkina Faso. And uh, also praying for Buddy Callahan and Yap. And then also Brother Larry and Diane Gallion is there uh, down in Georgia, I believe it is, uh, at a fair. And um, I believe he texted me today and said that they'd had not as much traffic as they were hoping for, but I believe they'd had nine people saved already. And that we're thanking the Lord you keep them in prayer. And then there's listed on the back some others in rehabs and in shut-ins and then our military and government officials. We've got many folks to pray for. And uh, we, we've got this word today that Miss Pat Bishop uh, fell and broke her arm. So I want you to keep back. Pat, Pat in your prayers and uh, maybe give a call sometime and encourage her. And then we're also praying for Chloe Magnus, Brother Bill and, and Miss Megan's granddaughter. Last week she fell off a trampoline and uh, had, had some issues as a result of that. And so please keep little Chloe in your prayers if you would please. And so we've got many folks to pray for. And you've got others to pray for as well, I'm sure. And I know sometimes when we have times like this, it seems a little long. But my friend, that there's no time that you can say we spent too much time in prayer. And I know it's not the bombastic part of the, of the service as far as loud and whatnot. But um, it's the power service of the week. It's the, uh, it's the one where you get a hold of the Lord. And I want you to not only pray for these requests, but I hope that on a regular, regular basis you are praying for the ministries of the church. As I said, not only the bus ministry, we're praying the, the Lord of the harvest. He'd send forth laborers into his harvest. And we're praying for that, but praying for the ministries of the church other than that as well. And that the Lord would t- come down and touch our services on Sunday. And then the buses keep us safe. And then let the, our bus workers find new riders and get them in here and our Sunday school teachers, our adult Sunday school, our uh, life stage classes that God would uh, just use them to get people cl- plugged into the church here. And uh, so please keep everybody in prayer. And then we certainly appreciate the prayers. I know that I do. And Brother Dan, of course, does. And Brother Kyle and Brother Daniel, we've got a lot to pray for. So I'm going to ask the organist to pray, play something through. You find somebody to pray with if you want or pray by yourself. And then we'll just go to the Lord on behalf of these folks. And then here in just a few moments, Brother Dan will come up and close this part of the service in prayer.
Heavenly Father, as the song says, we need you. And we need you now more than we ever have before. And Lord, we pray for each and every one whose name was mentioned and listed. And Lord, um, we failed to mention um, Brother Richard Wampler. He was listed on that sheet, Lord. And today, as we spoke to him and Miss Risa, they had just received some news that added to all that they've that he's going through right now, Lord, was not good news. And Lord, at times when things seem so overwhelming, humanly speaking, to you, nothing is overwhelming. To you, nothing is too much. And Lord, we know that you're in control. So we pray for wisdom for the doctors and the nurses and Lord, I just pray that you would touch his body, that you would heal him, Lord, all these. Lord, there's so many times that things of humanly speaking have been exhausted, and we do look upward, we depend on you, and we lean on you. We know that ultimately you know exactly what's going on. Lord, we thank you that we have that hope. Not only the hope that you're with each and every one of us right now. Not only the hope that you are the divine healer. Not only the hope that you are in control of our circumstances. But we also have that hope of everlasting life that was provided through your Son, shedding his perfect blood for us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for heaven. We thank you for that hope that you give each and every one of us. We thank you for the gift of the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit that abides with us everywhere we go each and every day. We thank you for your peace when we bring our prayers and our requests to you with thanksgiving. You give us your peace that passeth all understanding. It doesn't make sense, humanly speaking, but it's a wonderful peace. We thank you for that. We thank you for your love. We thank you for salvation again, Lord. And we thank you for the fellowship of fellow believers in Christ and the body of Christ. We thank you for that. Lord, thank you so much for who you are and what you've allowed us to be part of by being part of your family. Thank you for that privilege of being called a child of God. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight, the song that has already been sung, those that will be sung, your word that will be preached. Lord, I pray that you would use each and every one of us for your honor and for your glory. Holy Spirit of God, be with pastor as he preaches. Give us what we need to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we're going to watch a missionary video from our missionary, Keith and Mandy Morris. Buenas tardes from... Milagro, Ecuador. Uh, this is the Morris family. Uh, we are here at the church where we're helping out with right now since we arrived here in March. And uh, I will show you that in just a second. But uh, before I get to that, we just want to thank the Lord once again for your support and your prayers. Um, we don't take that lightly. And it's, you know, God has used the church there to help us be here. We represent you here. And uh, we're uh, praying for souls, praying for people to be discipled. And, and uh, it's been a blessing since we've been here. I've been able to uh, be in discipleship classes, see people get baptized after they've been saved and uh, those things. So thank you again. We're doing well. 
We're staying busy, trying to learn the language. Very important. If we really want to get to a person's heart, uh, we need to know the language. And so we're working on that. We're better than we were when we first got here. And just continue to pray for us, the family, me, Mandy, and uh, our kids um, uh, to do such. And uh, But uh, once again, it's uh, been a privilege to be here so far. We're here for his work. Uh, for him to use us so we're trusting he'll do that and so at this time what I'll do is I'll show you the front of the church and then we'll go in right now at this very moment they're having the death service let me uh, show you the church okay so here is the church from my car and you can see there there's the whoops sorry about that the sign Iglesia Bautista Biblica Here's the road, we're on a main road. So we are headed to the church right now. The, the building. So here we go, there's Miss Mandy there. And you can see they're having their service right now. So anyways, thank you once again. And there you have a little glimpse of our church. Miss Mandy. Number 375, it is well, it is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way.
15, there's a chorus that I'd like to teach you tonight if you don't know it. Some of you may already know it. My Lord lives the way. No matter what you're going through, amen. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Strength for today is mine all the way. For the first time tonight, for the first time, well, there's a few of you. Well, you did really well. I, could, I couldn't tell. Let's sing that one more time. This is a lovely, lovely chorus. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is fall. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is fall. Today is mine all the way, and all I need for tomorrow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. Great job. You may be singing. Amen. Thank you so much for singing, and what a wonderful group of songs. Just to think about how much the Lord blesses, leads us, and... What a joy to get to sing together. Well, we're going to continue on this evening for the next few moments here and uh, about the home, and we're looking at children and the Christian home. And now some of you, before we get started, you may have the objection, I don't have any children in my home anymore. And maybe you never did. God doesn't bless every home with children, and that certainly doesn't mean that they're any better or worse. Uh, uh, they may have more money but than the ones that do, but that's beside the point. Um, it doesn't matter about that. God doesn't bless every home with children. Or you may be saying, well, my, mine are long gone. Well, I challenge you not to let them go too long, too far, because your grandchildren, or maybe somebody say, well, I'm great-grandchildren, my grandchildren are grown. Whichever group you're able to latch on to, even if you're not able to latch on to them in a tangible way because they're not right here, you still don't want to count yourself out on the impact that you can have in their lives. They need all the help we can get. I know with my children, of course, you know how old ours are, and, uh, but we, we certainly count on the influences of our family, and we're certainly thankful for that. It speaks volumes for you grandparents. Can I just tell you? It speaks volumes for you to still be in church when your grandkids come back around to visit you on a weekend. And they say, well, no, it's Sunday morning. You know where we're going. That's a huge statement without you even saying a word. And those of you who have children in here that are watching their grand, you're, they're watching their, their children's grandparents, they know that that's true. So don't count it out. I trust that the Lord will give us something tonight, even if you don't have children in the home, if they're out of the house or whatever. And it's still the Word of God, and I trust it will be a blessing to you. Would you open to Psalm 127? Psalm 127, as we look here, we'll see in verse number 3. I was looking at Psalm 123, 3, 123, 3, and I said, well, I'm not sure how I'm going to make that verse apply to family. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. <laughs> Have mercy upon us. We're exceedingly filled with contempt. So hopefully that's not your house. <laughs> but if it is, shame on you, I guess. God help you. Lord, have mercy on us. But that's 123, 3, 127, 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. They're a gift from God. And I know that there are people that sometimes challenge that statement. They think, well, I don't know. Might have been in such trouble and they've been this and they've been this. Let's just get it settled tonight where they come from. They're an heritage of the Lord. They're a gift from God. And the Bible says the fruit of the womb is his reward and that God has given those. We're going to go and we'll get into these verse 4 and 5. We might as well read them now. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of his youth, of the youth. 
Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so I trust that tonight will be a blessing to us as we get started for these next few moments. And uh, let us see what God has given in the, in the realm of children. Now, again, as I mentioned, some of you don't have children at home. Some of my family members, uh, God never blessed their home with children. But uh, some of those that he didn't, they have been a huge impact on my children's life more than they'll ever know. So thank the Lord for it. Father, bless us now as our prayer. I pray that this Bible study would be a profitable time for everybody in attendance. And Lord, I'm thinking of young people that are represented by some parents. Some are represented by grandparents. Some will be benefited, although I will never meet them, dear Lord, because they're far away. But I pray that you would do a work in our hearts tonight and you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the greatest blessings that God often gives homes, and that is children. But here's my thought tonight as we get started in this Bible, Bible study. Since they came from God, we have a responsibility to train them, teach them, nurture them, and, and, and raise them, rear them in the way that God wants us to. Doesn't it fa- factor in that way when somebody gives you a gift and if they've gone to the trouble of buying something for you, giving something for you, if you respect that person and you know how they would want that thing used, then you oftentimes try to honor their wish and act in that regard. And so the same would be with the Lord. And so I wanted to give you some basic points tonight and I trust it'll be a blessing. Number one, as we get started, I think in this aspect that God gives us children to be a help for, for us to be a help in evangelism. (laughs) Just to speak it plainly, we need more workers out there in the harvest field. And it's a shame that sometimes our own children are, uh, again, going away from where they ought to be, but we ought to pray diligently that, Lord, please use them in your kingdom. Use them for the glory of your name. And so we ought to look at children. It gives us a part in evangelism. What a wonderful opportunity we have to see children saved Uh, One of the churches we served at, um, one of the bus captains told a heartbreaking story of how he had had many children on his bus, but he pointed to one house and said, I'm not able to go over to that house. That was where his children lived through a broken marriage and uh, just some difficulties, not that he had done anything physically wrong to them, but he wasn't able to minister to those children like he wanted to. Don't take for granted the first and foremost ministry that parents get to have is that of their own children. And maybe you've got some adult children aren't where they're supposed to be. Don't ever throw in the towel when they're, as long as they're still breathing, there's hope for them. You say, but they've gone so far. Not so far that God can't get a hold of them. And we ought to realize that our first and foremost ministry is to our children if God gives them to us and we understand that we have a part in this evangelism. You say, evangelism? What do you mean? I mean seeing them get saved. See them call out to the Lord in salvation and then live their lives in in such a way that they uh, help go reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to raise them up for the Lord. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 4, to bring them up. We've talked about this verse in recent weeks. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's the only child-raising plan God has in the nurture and admonition of of the Lord. And I know that, as I mentioned already, some of you are taking on the second duty. Your, your children are not necessarily engaged in your grandchildren's life, and you're having to come alongside and be that person to them. Well, praise the Lord. Don't be that one that says, well, I've got to do this. Just be the one that says, I'm thankful that I can. And maybe you've come alongside of your, children, of your siblings' children, all the rest. But we see that we're supposed to raise them for the Lord. Whatever area of impact you've got, use it. Influence is such a powerful thing that we often overlook. You say, well, I don't know. You have more than you think. And you ought to utilize it for the glory of God. Do you know that the majority of people come to, come to Christ in their youth? We thank the Lord for every 70-year-old that gets saved. We thank the Lord for every adult that gets saved. But statistics say that 85% of the people who ever get saved are saved before they turn 15 years of age. So understand the 85, 15, there's no correlation between them. That equals 100. I'm saying that before the age of 15, 
85% of the people who are ever going to get, they're, if they're going to get saved any time in their life, they're saved by the time they're 15. Does that mean they can't get saved at 16, 17? Of course not. We rejoice with every, I heard recently of a 90-year-old person that came to faith in Jesus Christ, and we thank the Lord for that, and we shout the victory. But I'm saying, statistically speaking, why does it, doesn't it make, why does it not strike us odd? Because the Lord said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Isn't it amazing that when he's talking about children, Jesus says, suffer them. That just means allow them. Let them. Let them come unto me. By the time they get to be adults, the Lord says, go in the highways and hedges and compel them. We've got to, you don't push somebody to get saved, but you've got to plead and, 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 and uh, imp imply, or not imply, but um, you've got to plead and implore them to get saved. You've got to compel them. But they, when they're saved, and you all have been teaching classes, many of you, a lot longer than I have, and you teach the lessons of those children, and it just seems like such a story that they're almost familiar with without even knowing it. When you tell them that Jesus loves you and he loves me, yes. And so realize that the majority of saved people come to Christ in their youth. And so don't forget this, that whatever part of a life that God lets you touch, you touch it. I'm so thankful. I watch it around here when you'll bring your nephews and you'll bring your nieces and your grand, uh, grandchildren and some other children that are somebody, else, uh, somebody else's responsibility, but you've taken it on as your ministry to say, well, I'm going to have them in Sunday school. Children give us a part in evangelism, but not only do we children give us a, pl a part in, a ch in evangelism, I want us to look also at the needs of the children. We were in Psalm 127, we're back there, or I'm still there. We see here, children are in heritage of the Lord. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full. I'm taking from this as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. I'm saying this on letter A underneath there, that children are to be prayed for. And let me explain why I've chosen that verse. Why get this point from these verses? Well, the only way to get to verse number 5 at the end, it says, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so the Bible likens these children, these arrows in the hands of a mighty man. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They'll stand up for God, but they shall speak or they shall come up against and confront the enemies in the gate. We're training soldiers, not real soldiers, but although the Bible says endure hardness as a good soldier, but we're training soldiers to fight the battle, fight the good fight of faith. You're training your children, your grandchildren to stand up against the wiles of the devil. You're training people in Sunday school classes to stand up and not be afraid of the enemy in the gate, as the Scripture says here. And so that's why I'm saying that children need to be prayed for. Your, your duty as a mom, as a dad, as a grandma, grandpa, whoever you are, uh, your duty is to pray for them on your knees and to be asking God to help them stand up and stand up rather and stand out against the enemies in the gate because they're going to need it in all of the hell that they have to get pushed out on them because of Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil put out against them. They're going to need your prayers. Children need to be prayed for. Not only do we see that, but children also need to be provided for. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8, we know this passage. It's one that, you know, some verses mean a lot more to certain people than others. And this one must have been a lot to my dad because it seems like we heard it quite a little bit. But if any man, if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, neither, uh, he hath denied the faith and is worth for, worse than an infidel. He always linked that one with that other verse says, man shall not work, neither shall he eat, or however it says it like that. And that must have been one of those life verses. You know, these preachers have these life verses. I believe that was a life verse of my dad. You don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> well, children need to be provided for. And so the Bible says that the one of the, the calling card of a Christian is love for brethren. Therefore, shall all men know you're my disciples because you have love one for another. But there's other things underneath that that should be a calling card for every Christian in here. And one of the things that a Christian ought to be known for is being a hard worker, somebody who provides for his family. Now, that does not mean that some people don't get hurt and get disabled and, and have to uh, rely on the benevolence of other people. 
better people than us have had that happen to them. That's not my point. But if we've got the ability, we ought to be that one that works hard to provide for our families. It's, it used to be a given that church folk, not Baptist people, church folk worked for what they got. And they didn't look for handouts. They provided for their own. And they did what was needed for the people that shared their last name especially. But if any provide not for his own, and specifically those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So children need to be provided for. I thank the Lord that God provides for our family through this church. This is, this is the only gig I've got. <laughs> but if that wasn't able, if some catastrophic thing happened to the church and they needed somebody to still pastor but we couldn't pay, then I would do that and I'd have to find some money somewhere else. And thank the Lord, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to do this full time. But you see, before I was a pastor at Buffalo Ridge Baptist Church, I was the husband of my wife and the, children, or the, the father to my children. So I have a greater responsibility to them to provide. And there was a time in our nation when that wasn't foreign to people. But sometimes it is now, but it should not be to Christian people. So I'm going to say it like this. Children are supposed to be prayed for and paid for. Now, as they get out toward the end, you're supposed to start teaching them to pay some of their own way. But especially when they're down there little, prayed for and paid for. Well, the prayed for part doesn't end. And I'm finding out from Amy and I are finding out the paid for stuff takes a lot longer than I thought it was going to. They kind of get more and more expensive as they go. But the needs of children, really it boils down to that. He'd be prayed for and provided for. Well, I want to look at the last one as we're getting on into it and how to rear children. Now, this is not, um, this is not a lesson on child rearing particularly because there are so many things that you could have to say. But I just hit a couple points that we could add in this as we're on this study of the Christian home. But back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you remember how the Lord said you're supposed to teach them the Word of God when, ri when they rise up and when they lie down? Here we see that we're supposed to be instructing them in God's Word. The Bible says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt, shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. We're supposed to instruct them in the word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, we already looked at that. But it, verse number 4, it tells them that we're supposed to bring them up, nurture and admonition. Those two verses, one in the Old, one in the New Testament, teach them that we are responsible to get it in them. Shame on us Americans when we say, well, we're just going to let them decide whatever they want to believe. We don't do that in any other, any, any other area of their life except for religion. We've got the truth, and we're Christians before we're Americans. We're, we're, we're Bible believers, and we, we love the Lord more than any nation. And so we don't mind teaching our children uh, patriotism, and I'm thankful for that. I'm a red-blooded American. I'm thankful for that. But more important than the country I reside in is the God that resides in me. And so we ought to understand that I'm supposed to instruct them in the Word of God. <coughs> it's <clears throat> my responsibility. You know that Allie goes to a Christian school and the other ones either went to home school or Christian school. Regardless of where that is, you understand that it's not the school's job, it's not the church's job, it's not the uh, youth director's job, it's not the Sunday school teacher's job. Now, we may, we may farm out some jobs to them. We say we're going to have them in Sunday school, we're going to have them in a Christian school, we're going to do these things. But you understand that it's mom and dad's job to get the Word of God into those young people and instruct them. Home comes first, then church and school, and everything that they need to know is your responsibility. You're the CEO of the corporation. If you choose to send them out somewhere to school or you choose to school, school them at home, that's between you, God, and your wife and all the parties involved. That's not my intent to tell you tonight. But what I'm saying is you're responsible. 
You, you find a good church, and we like to think you've found one, so you find a good church, whether it be in Sunday school and children's church and children's classes and kids' missions and missions classes and all that, but even though you have that and that's playing an important role, you're still the one that's the head of that household, Dad and, and Mom, as you work together in that. Dad's the head of it. You're still the one that's responsible for that, and we're supposed to instruct them in the Word of God. And then I want to take you to a maybe a strange passage that's just really kind of an object lesson on discipline or chastening in Hebrews chapter 12. You're not only supposed to instruct them in God's Word, you're supposed to discipline them. And here in this passage in Hebrews chapter 12, we'll find that this is referencing God's chastening to us. And this is not a lesson on God's chasing to us, but it's almost been lost in our current Christian culture that God still cares how you and I live. If you watch many modern church services or many, here listen to me, modern uh, pastors, pretty much anything goes. It doesn't matter how you live because God loves you so much that He couldn't, get, couldn't care less how you live. Well, God does love you more than you could ever imagine, and he doesn't, he doesn't love you because you were lovely. He just loves you because He's good, and He's God, and He's holy, and He loves. And, but he, he, that is true, but He does expect us as Christians to live in a pleasing way to Him. Well, in that spot, this passage of Scripture is talking about how God chastens those that don't live right. But on the heels of that, or in that same teaching, we'll find some interesting thing about just as kind of a backhanded, side-handed teaching we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chasing of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. And what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So we look on down in verse number 10. For they verily for a few days, they being these fathers, chastened us after their own pleasure. And that doesn't mean that dad and mom got pleasure out of the spankings or whatever was involved there. But it just means after their own way or the way they felt was best. But he, that's God, for our profit that we might part be partakers of of his holiness. Look at verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. You know, I'm a big believer in every, every passage of Scripture has an interpretation, and the interpretation is that God chastens those of us who get out of line. We, him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it's sin, and we understand that God gets our attention. He convicts us by the Holy Spirit, his, uh, and then after that, He chastens us. But then on the application of this passage, it's just kind of a side teaching. God uses the illustration, if you will, of how children have a father, and that father, those fathers, chasten them to get them to be where they need to be. And that's where I draw our teaching from on this point. We're supposed to discipline those children according to God's Word, and this whole illustration here that God talks about Him, our Heavenly Father, chastening us is given on the backs of, of a disciplining Father. So how to rear children? We need to instruct them. Tell them what's right. We need to tell them what's not right. And then after we've communicated to them what's not right, then there needs to be some consequences for them when they do what isn't right. You say, oh, preacher, I could never speak harshly to my child. Well, we see a lot of those kids out. If you work in a public school, <clears throat> well, Josh, different people, you work in public, you see lots of people. Well, public school, any school, it doesn't matter which one it is. We see lots of people who were, have children who were, or we see lots of children who have never been spoken to to say no. My brother, you know, he's a state trooper. He catches up a lot with, with them. And I asked Dan one time, I said, well, isn't everybody pretty humble when you actually get them dead to rights about something? He said, no, you'd be surprised. He said, they're still just arrogant and tell me, just go ahead and do what you got to do. I'm, 
I'm late or I went out of here or whatnot. So my point in saying that is coming all the way back that children have to be taught what no is because it's going to serve them in all of their life. And you and I as parents, we have the responsibility to teach it to them while they're young so they can save them a whole lot of headache and heartbreak. So we're supposed to discipline them. You say, well, I believe that's disciplining them according to God's Word, as I put in here, disciplining them in to get in the Bible. That's one of it. Train up a child the way he should go, uh, and when he's older, not depart from it. Train him up according to his bend, according to the way he's supposed to go. That means that every child's a little different. Some of them are outgoing, some of them are introverts. Some of them are going to be leaders, and some of them are going to be very, very happy just to be the behind-the-scenes worker in some, fa- some uh, industry or whatever. You and I as parents, as they get older and we f- see where they're headed, we are supposed to equip them for whatever path God has for them. But can I give us this point? Every one of them, regardless whether they're going to be the CEO at the top of the company, the pastor of the church, or the unsung hero back behind and 14 layers back that never gets any accolades, whichever one they're going to be, whichever path, whichever bend they're going to be in, every one of them is supposed to come by way of the cross. Every one of them is supposed to come by way of disciplining themselves in the tenets of the Word of God. Sometimes we act like, well, some kids are different, and that's true, they are. And they're all different. They're all unique. But all of them are supposed to be taught the Word of God, instructed in the disciplines of the Word of God, and, as I mentioned before, learn what no means and what respect is and all those things, because it matters not whether they're going to be this flamboyant, uh, outward-going extrovert or turned-in introvert that wants to be working, working by him or herself on whatever project they're on, matters not. Each of them needs to be living in view of the cross and living their life knowing that their, life, their, their duty is to work for the kingdom of God. If they own the company or they run the church or they run the ministry or they or an executive over there, they're an engineer over there, they're a janitor over there, they're a behind-the-scenes person over there, matters not. Each one of them are supposed to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's our primary job as parents. But then also, they're all supposed to be in control of their own self. You want to know that person that's going to run a company sometime? They're never going to run a company until they can control themselves first. And that's what parents are there for. Children are in heritage of the Lord, the Bible says. They're a gift from Him. We're given the responsibility as parents to rear them for Him so that as they grow and live their life, they can live it unto Him. God didn't give us our children for our own pleasure. Now, they're a lot of fun. Not all the time. Yes, I know that. But He didn't give us primarily for that. He did give us for them to enjoy. He gave us all things richly to enjoy. But he gave them to us, if you've got some, for a purpose. For them to be taken going out for his kingdom. And may our children be realized that that's what we're training them for. And as you know, Amy and I are in that spot where Jared's already moved out. And we realize that after all the people that have told us this, now we're starting to see it. You don't raise them to keep them. You raise them to send them on. And then don't tell me about sometimes they come back. I don't want to hear about that. I want to keep them as long as I can keep them. But after they're gone, they're gone. (laughs) But may we truly take inventory. And I leave you with this, what I've already told you. But I just feel so impressed to tell you again. Whatever position you get to have in somebody's life, please don't take it for granted. And don't neglect it. You can speak words into their life that maybe nobody else can. If you're that uncle that doesn't get to see him too often, but when you do, uh, don't, don't let the times you see him be the time that you're nagging about something that everybody else is always nagging him about. Tell him something that will benefit him. 
If you're the grandparents and you don't get to see them like you want, <clears throat> be those ones that pray and seek the Lord and pray His power over their lives. Just because you're not the ones that are literally raising them with these hands doesn't mean you can't raise them on your knees. Children are in heritage of the Lord. Father, bless us now is our prayer. And I trust, dear Lord, that everybody in this room got something from this Bible study. <clears throat> as simple as it is, Lord, it's so needed. I believe that some good Christians, we have forgotten that our children just weren't given for our pleasure. They are given for your pleasure. Our children weren't just given for a volley to see whether they go right or go wrong. Lord, they're given for us as arrows in the hands of a mighty man. Lord, may we pray him through to where you want him to be. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You know, I never like to close a service without asking this, giving an opportunity for somebody. Perhaps you're here. You're not sure that you're saved. If that's you, my friend, in just a moment, the ladies are going to play something through. And if you have a question about that or you know good and well you're not on your way to heaven, we're going to stand in just a moment. I invite you to come right down in front of the pulpit. I'll meet you down there. I'll just take the Bible and show you how you can be sure you're saved. And then to every person in here that's got an impact on a person, children's, a child's life, whether you come here to the front or make an altar out of your pew right there where you stand or sit, would all of us pray for the young people that we get the chance to interact with? And may we pray that God would use them in a mighty way. That means they're going to have to be disciplined. That means they're going to have to be saved, of course. And may we be diligent in our prayers and our work with them. Thank you. Would you stand together as the ladies play something through? If God spoke to your heart, I invite you to come. The altar is open. You're welcome to come and pray. Pray for somebody. Pray for yourself. Pray with us. Brother Dan to come back up and lead us in that course so as he was teaching us my Lord knows the way through the wilderness if you're able to get that back up on the screens and we'll sing that through a couple of times as our going home song it's a great one just to singing when you're going through the grocery store and until somebody says hey quiet down I'm trying to concentrate on what pork and beans to buy but um but a good one to sing as you go through the grocery store or wherever you're at and out in work. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. And after we sing that, you're dismissed. Thank you for being in church tonight. Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All